be seated. This time we're going to dismiss our children for junior church so our children can go out. Be mindful of all the car seats down the aisle. You don't trip over them. This morning is uh, Pastor Eric and Judy's final Sunday with us for a month. And a half. They are departing after the morning service, heading south and uh, going to minister at a uh, retirement community in Florida. And uh, Pastor Eric will be the resident pastor there for a month, conducting services and ministering to the folks there. And so we pray the best for them and safe travels down. I said they could go under one condition that they brought the sunshine back with them when they came back in April. And so they have obliged to do that. So that means winter is coming to a close. So we're we're getting close. If you take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Exodus, uh, we're going to be in several places in Exodus this morning, but uh, you start Exodus 33 is where we're going to begin. We finished up reading the book of Exodus this week in our Bible reading program, and this morning we plunged into, with excitement, the book of Leviticus. And, uh, and we are journeying our way through God's Word. So this morning I'm going to speak about kind of summarizing a little bit of the book of Exodus, and I trust also helping to kind of prepare us for the book of Leviticus as we read it together as a church And as I studied this week and and read the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus is the the story of the nation of Israel coming out of uh, Egypt and becoming the nation of Israel, becoming the people of God. And it's a fascinating transition from the beginning of the book of Exodus to the end of the book of Exodus. Israel, in a sense, goes through a national identity crisis. I mean, at the start of the book of Exodus, they know who they are. They're slaves. They live in Egypt. They serve the Egyptians. They are there to serve their masters. Then God miraculously intervenes and God rescues his people and delivers them from the Egyptians and parts the Red Sea and takes them into the wilderness. And after 400 years, they're finally free. But who are they? (laughs) Who are the people now? What are they supposed to do? What's the reason for their existence now? Uh, Those questions had been fairly straightforward in Egypt. They didn't really have a say in the matter. This was who they were. This is what they did. But as Israel now comes out into the wilderness and begins this journey, not just the journey of the Exodus, but this journey of a relationship with God, there's some fairly important questions that Israel needs to wrestle with. Who are they as a nation? Their identity. Uh, What are they to do? What is exactly their calling then as a nation? How are they supposed to exist And why? Why do they exist as a nation? What is their purpose? What is the reason behind God delivering them and setting them apart? And it's interesting, as they reflect on those questions, those are some of the most basic questions of life. Uh, Those are questions that you and I all wrestle with. Who are we? What are we to do? And why are we here? In fact, there isn't a human being that doesn't wrestle with those questions, trying to answer them for themselves. And it's interesting about those questions is you don't just answer them once in your life. It's not like you figure out those answers in your 20s and then you're set. No, then you find out you hit your 30s and those questions are asked all over again of you and you wonder, who am I? What am I supposed to do? Why am I here? By God's grace, maybe you get the answers to those, and then your 40s come, and you're hit again. Who am I? What am I doing? Why am I here? And then it happens again and again and again. These are questions that we wrestle with our entire lives, understanding our existence, the reason that we are here. What is interesting about those questions is that few of us have probably ever sat down and actually contemplated them. Maybe you're unusual and a little different. Maybe you actually have had that. Maybe you had somebody over for supper to discuss the reason for existence. That, that's possible. Kudos if you've done that. Most of us probably don't do that. But yet there are questions that we're answering continually on a daily basis. When you just stand back and look at your life, if you were to kind of have an out-of-body experience and you would be able to watch yourself living out a day or a week in your life, what you would see 
is somebody trying to understand who they are. Somebody trying to understand what they're supposed to do. Someone trying to understand why they are here. Those questions are at the very basis of what it means to be a human being. How do we answer those questions? And the, the, the scary part about those things is that there's actually a lot of answers to those questions. The world gives many, many answers to those questions. But as Israel came out of Egypt, as they uh, began this relationship with God, they found that the answer to all of those questions centered on one thing. And that was the presence of God with his people. And they found that the answer to all of those questions, their identity, who they were, and their calling, what they were supposed to do, and, and their purpose, why they were there, all rested on the fact that the God of the universe, the God that had delivered them, the God that had redeemed them, was now going to dwell with them. And if you and I are to answer those questions as God desires us to, it's going to be no different. At the center of those questions is the presence of God in our lives. So we're going to answer those questions in the book of Exodus this morning from different passages. So before we do that, we need to pray and we need to ask God's help. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the privilege of coming to Scripture this morning. Uh, God, as Israel journeyed through the book of Exodus and, and this journey of understanding their relationship with God and how their relationship with God and God's presence among them played out into their own lives and helped them understand who they were and helped them understand what they were to do and helped them to understand their reason for existence God, the same is true in our own lives. And as we wrestle with those questions, as we look at them through the lens of Scripture this morning, I pray you would provide clarity and help for us that we would live for you. God, thank you for your love and for your grace towards us. In Jesus' name, amen. The first place we're going to begin is Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, and God's presence we see in this passage here defined who the people were. The question of identity, the question of understanding who the nation of Israel was, was defined by the presence of God with them. Now last week we looked at Exodus chapter 32, and in Exodus 32 we have the, the incident of the golden calf, where Israel, uh, the nation of Israel, builds for themselves an idol, a calf, and they worship that idol, but the, the, the God who's on the mountain and His glory is there as a devouring fire is not pleased with His people, and judgment comes upon them. At the beginning part then of Exodus chapter 33, God says to Moses, you know what, Moses? I'm going to send my angel before you, and you're going to go up to the promised land, and you're going to conquer the promised land, and I'm going to bless the people. I am going to do everything I promised to do, except I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to stay here. I'll send my angel. I will provide all the blessing of my presence, except my presence will stay here, lest I consume them. So you think they're going to get all the blessing of God's presence, but without the presence of God. Now, if you remember in the book of Exodus, the presence of God is a fairly startling thing. The presence of God is like a devouring fire on top of the mountain, such that in Exodus 19, God says to Moses, make sure the people don't even touch the mountain. If they touch the mountain, they're to be put to death. But in putting them to death, don't touch those people that are to be put to death. You need to shoot them with an arrow or stone them. You can't even touch those people. So the presence of God is a terrifying thing. So God says, I'm not going to go with you, but I will bless you and I'll give you all of my blessing, but my presence will not be among you. Moses responds with incredible faith and clarity in Exodus 33 and verse 15. And Moses says, he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. A remarkable statement by Moses. Moses says, God, if you're not going with me, then we're not going. Moses says, God, I would rather live in the dry, arid desert with you than in the lush, promised land of Canaan, full of all the blessings that you would give, but without your presence. 
And what is interesting in, in Moses' statement is that Moses actually makes the decision for the people. Uh, notice he said, if your presence will not, go with, will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Moses is God's representative of the people. Uh, Moses is, is like a parent that knows best for the children. And Moses speaks on behalf of the people and says, God, if you don't go with us, if your presence is not with us, then we're not your people. Notice what he says in verse 16. Moses says, For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight? I and your people, is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct? I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth. Moses understood that it was the presence of God that makes the people of God the people of God. You can have all the blessing of God, but if you do not have God, the reality is you do not belong to Him. In other words, to say it like this, you can gain the world, but if you do not have God, you have nothing. The presence of God with the people of Israel was not a luxury. It was the very essence of who the people were. The question of identity, the question of who, who is Israel, was answered by the fact that God was dwelling with the people. In fact, this was the reason that God even redeemed them. Back in Exodus 29, God says this to Moses. He says, I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. In other words, the people of Israel had not been brought out of Egypt. They had been bought out of Egypt. God had redeemed the people out of Egypt. He had purchased them for himself. Who were the Israelites? The answer to that question is that they are the redeemed people of God. Their sense of identity, their sense of understanding who they were was directly tied to the fact that God had redeemed them from Egypt. The temptation for Israel in the coming days, weeks, years, decades, and centuries would be to forget who had, brought, who had bought them, and thus they would give themselves to another. See, the lesson that Israel would learn is that one's identity is shaped by who one serves. Uh, that was the problem with the golden calf incident in Exodus chapter 32. Who you are is shaped by who you serve. I could ask you this morning, do you know who you are? I could ask you this morning, do you understand who you are in Christ? But the real question is, who are you serving? Or to say it like this, what is the desire of your heart? Because that which we desire is that which we serve. And that which we serve is that which determines how we see ourselves. If you desire success, if that's what you want above all else, then you will serve that which you think makes you successful. And your sense of understanding who you are will be determined by whether or not you achieve what you think is success. If you desire popularity, then guess what? You are going to serve those people and things that you think will make you popular. And your sense of understanding who you are will be derived from those things. If you desire ease and comfort, then you're going to serve that which you believe will make you comfortable and easy. And your understanding of who you are is going to be determined about how hard or easy life is. The reality is, is that there are thousands of voices shouting at us, calling us, tempting us. Satan knows that man must have an answer to this question. We can't function without a sense of understanding who we are. And so what does Satan do? He keeps offering us answers. He doesn't really care what the answer is so long as the answer is not God. Because when our hearts get gripped by the love and the grace of God, it exposes all the cheap counterfeits in life. It exposes everything else. And just like Israel was redeemed from Egypt, so too we are redeemed. Paul writes in Galatians 4, he says, When the fullness of time had come, 
God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoptions, adoption as sons. You think Israel's redemption from Egypt was something? Israel's redemption has nothing upon our redemption. God didn't just free us from slavery. He freed us from sin. He adopted us into his family. And this should define everything who we are. As believers in Jesus Christ, as the church of Jesus Christ, who are we? We are the blood-bought people of God. We are saved from sin and eternal wrath. And this isn't just a side issue. It's the essence of who we are. But the temptation that we face as believers is the same temptation that Israel faced. The temptation we face is that we would forget who bought us and that we would give ourselves to another. One writer coins this phrase. He calls it gospel amnesia, when we forget who we are. Now, we can, if I were to ask you this morning, you could give me the proper answer. But what happens is in the living out of our lives, we begin to live for other things instead of ultimately living for Christ. And those things begin to shape how we see ourselves. And so we see ourselves as someone successful or, or someone who's a failure. Instead of seeing ourselves as God sees us, instead of seeing ourselves as Christ sees us, as Paul says, adopted sons and daughters of Christ. Now, this is hugely important because we're not going to be able to, to serve and be what God wants us to be, uh, do what God wants us to do unless we understand who we are in Christ. Now, it's interesting. This is one of the reasons that we actually gather as a church family. What are we doing here on Sunday mornings as we preach God's word, as we hear God's word, as we sing God's word, as we pray? We're, we're reminding ourselves who we are. This is our, our identity. We are the people of God, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and that is to help focus our hearts on that which matters, so that when we go out from here this week, whether that's to school or work or home or, 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 or wherever it is that we go, that we would not be tempted to place our value and the image of ourselves in other things other than Jesus Christ. And to be reminded then of who we are. God's, God's presence for Israel reminded them and told them who they were. And so God's presence in our lives and his redeeming us from sin defines who we are. God's presence also defined what the people were to do. Turn with me to Exodus 25. Exodus chapter 25. God's presence not only defined who the people were, it defined what the people did. Because God had redeemed Israel, and because God had chosen to dwell with Israel, their primary task as a people was to be holy. Was to be holy. Now, as we come to the book of Exodus, and we think about God dwelling with man again, it, it's a thought that on one hand is refreshing. Because that's God's desire, is to dwell with man. But as we're reading the Bible, when was the last time that God dwelt with man? Well, we would have to go back, a long way back, to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, when God dwelt with Adam and Eve in the garden. But what happened in Genesis chapter 3? Sin entered the world. And as a result of sin, God was separated from His creation. No longer were Adam and Eve able to dwell in the garden with God. And so all the way through the book of Genesis, God is still active and, and God visits Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and God is watching and God is still sovereignly orchestrating history. But God is not dwelling with man because sin has separated. But then we come to Exodus and God says to the people of Israel, I am going to dwell with you. Now, that is a terrifying thought. If you're an Israelite standing at the bottom of Mount Sinai with the devouring fire of God on top of the mountain. I mean, God says in Exodus 19, you can't even touch the mountain or you'll die. And Moses comes down off the mountain. He says, I got good news. God's going to come down off the mountain. And he's going to dwell with us right in our midst. And if you're an Israelite, you go, we're toast. <laughs> How can God on the mountain like that. How can that God dwell here in our midst? 
And as those reading the Bible, we would ask the same question. Well, God, you, you separated from Adam and Eve because of sin. How then can you dwell with a people that are sinful? Well, the answer is in Exodus 25. In verse number 8, God says this, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all its furniture, so shall you make it. How is it going to be that the people of God, that, that the holiness of God will dwell amongst the people? Well, the answer to that question is that the people are going to make a holy place, a sanctuary, a place that is set apart where the holiness of God will come and dwell. Holy simply means to be set apart. And so the holy God can only dwell in a holy place. Why? Because any other place will be consumed by his holiness. Now, we're reminded, we're reminded again, God's not doing something new here. Uh, rather, God is redeeming, returning back to that which he had begun at first. God has always desired to dwell among his people. And so God is saying, okay, I'm going to dwell amongst man once more. So what, what, what happens in the book of Exodus? There's 40 chapters in the book of Exodus, and for 14 of those chapters, God details to the people of Israel how they're supposed to build this holy place. It's, it's the greatest chunk of the books of, book of Exodus is given to the details of the tabernacle. Now, when we read them today, we go, didn't I just already read that? Like, why do we got to go through all of that all over again? But if you're an Israelite at the bottom of the mountain and the holiness of God is about to come off that mountain into the camp, you're saying, can you run that by me again? I just want to make sure we got that right. And then God says, these are the two guys that are going to build it. And you start praying for those two guys and you sure hope that they know what they're doing as they follow God's instructions because God is going to come and dwell amongst the people. But it brings about a whole other question. So the holiness of God is going to come and dwell in a holy place, in a sanctuary. But how can the holiness of God come and dwell amongst the people that is unholy? Well, that's the book of Leviticus. The book of Exodus details the building of a holy place. The details of Leviticus give us the living of a holy people. Both are essential if God is going to dwell with man. There needs to be a holy place and there needs to be a holy people. So what is the calling of Israel? What is Israel's mission, so to speak? What are they to do? Well, they are to live holy lives so as to keep the sanctuary holy and so to keep themselves holy so that the presence of God would continue to dwell among them. In fact, we come to the book of Deuteronomy and it's made crystal clear in the book of Deuteronomy that if they are to follow God's word and in following God's word, they will be holy and set apart. If they follow God's word, God will look after them. God will care for them. God will provide their needs. But if they do not follow God's word, if they are in change unholy, then God's judgment will come upon them. So what is God looking for? God is looking for obedience in his people, that they would follow him, that they would do his will and follow his word. But what is the temptation of Israel as we follow through the word of God? What is Israel tempted to do? Again and again, Israel is tempted to lean on their own understanding instead of trusting and following God. Right? Israel again and again is tempted to chart their own course. Right From Exodus 25, right, all we have to do is go to Exodus 32, and what happens? Where's Moses? I don't know where Moses is. Let's make a golden calf. What are they doing? They chart their own course. Right? As we read the rest of the Old Testament, what happens again and again and again? That's the battle that plays out. What does God want among his people? Holiness. And what does Israel want to do? They want to go their own way. And there's a tension, there's a battle that comes out. The lesson Israel would learn is that the only course that leads to holiness is the one God has mapped out. The challenge is that Israel's calling is not so different from our own. Now, we don't have a tabernacle or a, a temple to maintain, and we don't have to uphold the law because Jesus has fulfilled the law for us. But God's standard of holiness hasn't changed. Uh, let me read for you the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. 
Peter writes to the church and he says, As he who called you is holy, you also should be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Well, where was that written? That was written in the book of Leviticus. The people of Israel were to be holy. Why? Because God was holy. And so what does Peter say about the church? You're to be holy. Why? Because God is holy. But how can we be holy? How can a sinful people be holy? Well, the answer in the Old Testament was the book of Leviticus. But we come to the end of the Old Testament, we realize that's really insufficient because man cannot do it. So then in the New Testament, what do we have as the answer? The Gospels. The Word becomes flesh. And the Holy God Himself steps out of heaven and Jesus takes human flesh upon Himself and He does what no other human has been able to do. He upholds the law. He fulfills the law. And then Jesus dies on the cross in your place and in my place. And Jesus takes the wrath of God upon Himself. So that as one places their faith and trust in Him, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, what happens? God forgives you of all your sin. When God looks upon you, what does he see? He doesn't see a failure. He doesn't see someone who's successful. He, what does he see? He sees the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees a blood-soaked saint. Now, did you do anything to deserve that? Did you do anything to earn that? <laughs> no more than Israel did in freeing themselves from Egypt. We did nothing. We did nothing. But what is the challenge that we face now? We are, we are made holy on the inside by believing in Jesus Christ and what he did for us. And what does God want us to do? He wants us to live out that holiness. He wants us to live set apart lives. He wants us to live holy lives. Right? So holiness means that you stand out. Holiness means that you're set apart. Holiness means you talk about different things and you use different words. And holiness means that uh, you'll have different experiences than those around you. And holiness means that you'll dress differently and you'll spend your money different. And you'll have different entertainment choices and you'll have different priorities in life. To live a holy life means, simply put, you're different. But what's the problem? We don't like to be different. <laughs> As human beings, we like to fit in. And it, it, it's fascinating. We live in a world that is highly individual. And it's all about individual expression. And if you go to a, a, a high school or you go to a college university and you'll see people that want to express their individuality. And if you follow that person around campus long enough, and maybe you might get in trouble. So if you do that, don't say, I told you. But if you follow them around long enough, guess what you'll find out? That that person that expresses themselves in that individual way guess where they end up? They end up with a certain group of people that all express themselves the same way. Why? Because as human beings, we want to belong. As human beings, we don't want to stand out. We, we, we want to be a part of something. But as soon as we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, guess what happens? <laughs> we are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Light stands out in a dark room. <laughs> is really hard to hide the light. And guess what God wants us to do? He wants us to stand out even more. He wants us to be holy. He wants us, others, to see. But how do we do that? How do we accomplish that? Well, there's another major difference between Israel and the church. It's that the church of Jesus Christ has the Spirit of God indwelling them. Israel had the presence of God in a tent, in a tabernacle in the middle. But as the church of Jesus Christ, we actually have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. Which does what? The Holy Spirit, He enables us then to actually live holy lives. He enables us to live set apart and different lives. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't overpower us as much as we would prefer that at times. Just, Spirit, you just come and make me do what's right. But He doesn't do that. The Spirit enables us to do that. 
So there, here's the rub. I have to surrender to his control. I have to be faithful where he has me. We were this morning in adult Sunday school class in the book of, Exodus, or book of Acts, and we didn't get through all we were going to go through. But when we come to the book of Acts, and we think about it in our theological framework, the, the, the book of Acts is a remarkable book of the Bible. Because the book of Acts is where we actually see the people of God finally become the people of God. And what do we see in the book of Acts? When you come to the book of Acts, the conclusion you should come to is the power of the Spirit of God amongst simple, ordinary people. If you come to the book of Acts and you're like, man, those early disciples are really smart. Man, they had a real great plan to grow the church. Oh, man, look at their ingenuity and look at their creativity. You've missed the point. If you come to the book of Acts and you're like, how did that happen? then you're understanding the book of Acts because it's the Spirit of God moving and working amongst the people of God. And that's what God desires in your life and my life. He calls us to holiness, and we go, God, I don't, that's a big ask. And he goes, I know. That's why I've given my spirit inside of you to live out your word in my life. And not only do we have the Spirit of God within us, but then look around the room. This is where we belong. So you're different, okay? Just let that sink in. You're different, but we're all different together. And God wants us to live holy lives and to be set apart together as the body of Christ. As human beings, we want to belong. God knew that. That's why he did just create a bunch of individual Christians to go around. What did he create? He created a body. He created a place where we actually belong together. And so in our gathering together here this morning, we not only have the Spirit of God within us, but we have the body of Christ to help us live our calling together and live holy lives. So God's presence defines who we are. It defines our calling in life to live holy lives. And lastly, here in closing, God's presence also defines why we exist. And turn back a few more pages in Exodus to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, and this is where God enters into the covenant with Israel. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, we read these words, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Uh, I love the language that God uses here. Israel was what? God's treasured possession. What a picture of love. When, when you look out at the religions of the world, when Israel looked at the religion of Egypt and all the gods of Egypt, gods used and abused their people. But the one true God didn't do that. The one true God redeemed his people. The one true God loved his people. His people were a treasured possession. And what was the result of that? God redeemed them. God purchased them to do what? To be a visible witness, a visible representation to the world. This is why God was taking them to the promised land. Why did God stick them in Canaan? I mean, why didn't God like take them somewhere out of the way where they could easily be separate and be out of the influence of the world. Instead, God sticks them right at the heart of where three continents come together. Every major road travels right through the land of Canaan. God, if you want your people to be different, if you want your people to stand out, then that's probably not the greatest place. There's going to be so much temptation there. But God says, yeah, but the point is, I want them to be a witness to the world. So I'm going to place them right at the heart of civilization so that as I set them apart, as that they are holy, the world will notice and the world will see. God is preparing his people in the wilderness and then he will put them on display for the world to see. Notice how this is tied to their identity and their calling. They are God's treasured possession and are to obey his voice. So by remembering who they were, by obeying God's word, they would be representing God to the world. It wasn't about who they were. The reality is it was ultimately about who God was. And and you think of the nation of Israel as we read the book of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Their national identity, their culture, their food, their holidays, their government structure, their worship all reflected who God was. You visited Israel, you're like, so... Why can't you eat that? Why do you have a holiday on this day? How come you're so different here? What is the answer? Well, it's because of our God. It's because of the God who redeemed us. 
is because we were in slavery in Egypt and, and our God, he came and he bought us out of that. And so we live according to his standard and his word. This is how he has called us to live. You see, they did not exist to make a name for themselves. They existed to make much of God. What were they? They were a nation of ambassadors. They were a kingdom of priests is the wording that, that God uses here, who represented God to the nation. But the temptation for Israel would be to think that they existed for themselves. It would be to live as if they were the answer. And the lesson that Israel would learn is that you can't exist for yourself and for God. And like Israel, God has redeemed you and I, and he has set us apart to be what? To be ambassadors to the nations. Uh, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he says, You, he's speaking to the church, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have a commission as a church, and it's, it's no different from Israel's commission. We are to be a light to who? A light to the nations. But we need to remember who we are and what God has called us to because there's a world that desperately needs to see Him. They don't need to see how smart we are. They don't need to see how put together we are. They don't need to see how many experiences we have. They don't need to see how broken we are. They need to see Jesus. That's what they need to see. And a church that knows who they are, a church who is living in holiness, knows that they have nothing to offer but Jesus Christ. And so as we think about Israel coming out of Egypt, and we think about Israel understanding who they were, and their calling, what God wanted them to do, and then their purpose, their reason for existence, we see the same for us. That God's presence among His people defines who we are. It gives us our identity. We are the redeemed people of God. It's our calling. We're to live holy lives. It's our purpose that we're to be a witness to Him to the nations. But what is fascinating is this. Those three questions, the question, who am I? What am I to do? And what is my purpose? Or why am I here? Those are questions that God has infused into the heart of every man. Your family, your coworkers, your neighbors, they're all asking those questions. They're all searching for those answers. And the reality is they will never find satisfactory answers to those questions apart from Jesus Christ, apart from finding them in God. So what has God done in his mercy? He has sent you and I into their lives to point them to that. He has sent you and I into their lives to show them to the only one who can answer those questions, to ultimately reflect Jesus Christ to the nations. And so it is for us. We are the redeemed people of God, called to live holy, separate lives so that the world will see, so that the world will take notice and that they too will see Jesus and come to faith in Him.